going to be. Um, Brad Rothschild, who directed and produced the film, is a classmate and friend of the Buckholtz family, the Colton Maxes, the Schwartzes, and of course, my family. We've known each other since, I want to say third grade, but don't hold me to it. It's, it's you know, at okay. least 15 years. Um, <laughs> um, and we, a couple of us had the pleasure of seeing this film when it was premiered at Lincoln Center as part of the Jewish Film Festival. And we immediately recognized so many elements that are important to Bethel, like interse intersectionality, tikkun olam, and community, and, and thought it would play really well here. Brad has an interesting knack of finding really um, different, perspectives on people and places. And this film has certainly been a way to get to know you, Tamar, and understand your experience in Chicago. And, it, you know, having seen Brad's other films, including a really great film that you should put on your list called The Tree Man, which I loved. Um, you know, Brad brought yet another person into our world. And we're really fortunate to have you, Brad, join us tonight, along with Tamar, who is featured in the film. Thank you so much for, for being here. My pleasure. And I'll turn it over to Rabbi Martyr. Thanks, Atara. Yes, I want to just echo Atara's gratitude. Um, we've been, you know, just in the last year, and I think a lot of synagogues have been doing this as well as a lot of Americans, um, as the conversation finally around racism is sort of much more coming to the forefront and doing a re-examination finally and taking stock of this history. We've been trying at Bethel also to examine the Jewish community. Um, and uh, and learn learn more about um, where we can where we can be better and just study study our own history and as Atara said the intersectionality of Jewish identity Jews of color and this film um, brings up so much um, I actually you know it's funny how Torah does this but we have just begun reading about the Mishkan about the tabernacle and the building of the Mishkan and in watching the film. Tamar, I was so struck by the Mishkan that you have created. Um, and it was so clear. You spoke about trying to create some order in the chaos and, uh, and in the wilderness. And that's exactly what, what the Mishkan, the tabernacle is as well in the Torah. And so I was so struck by, by the Mishkan you're creating and we're just eager to learn more um, and, to, and to hear more of your story. So how this is gonna work is uh, I have some questions and we're gonna ask Brad and Tamar. And I also want you to, um, everyone here, to put your questions that you have in the chat function. And we will get to the questions that we get to. And I'm sure there will be some overlap with what I'm asking um, and what many are asking. So um, everyone can just, can just type, you can put it in the public chat or you can send me a private chat um, if need be. Um, but that's really how this is going to be. So everyone got to watch the film. Raise your hand if you got to see the film. Good. Well, the film is incredible. The film is absolutely fascinating and, um, and beautifully done and honest and sensitive and so interesting. Um, so we wanna start you know, by asking you, Brad, about this incredible story and about the incredible Tamar. How did you first come across Tamar and her work in the community? And when did you know that this was a filmable story that you had to tell? The origin story, Tamar, Tamar loves this story. By the way, uh, it, it was October of 2016, and uh, I was reading an article in the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. They have a daily uh, email blast, which I'm sure many people on this call receive. There's an article. The title was "Black Rabbinical Student Leads Army of Moms Against Gun Violence in Chicago." And I thought, oh, this looks pretty interesting. Let me let me see what this is about. And at the top of the article, there's a picture of this striking woman, Bar Manasseh. And I go on to read about the incredible work that she's doing on the south side of Chicago to try to prevent gun violence and the organization that she created called MASS, Mothers and Men Against Senseless Killing. And her personality jumped out at me from this piece. I could feel that she was an incredible person. And really what pulled me in was the part where Tamar credit, credited her Judaism for her activism. And I thought, this is somebody I want to talk to. This is somebody I need to know more about. And even from that first article, I felt 
this is something I want to make a film about. Um, so I reached out to Tamar. I didn't, I have nobody in common. We have no friends in common or had no friends in common at the time. I had no way of getting in touch with her other than via social media or her and her, um, her organization's website. And I sent her an email. I introduced myself as a filmmaker in New York City. And I wrote, quite frankly, I think you, your story would make a, a really interesting documentary film. And she didn't write back immediately. She didn't respond to my first inquiry. It took a little while. And finally, I got an email back. And the email said, thank you for your interest. I think my life is about as interesting as watching the paint dry. So I'm going to pass. And I wrote back and I said, with all due respect, I disagree. And I hope that you will reconsider because I think this could be interesting. And that, that started this on again, off again correspondence. The on being me reaching out to her, the off <laughs> being her not responding to me very frequently. Uh, and then we spoke on the phone uh, a couple of times. And after each conversation, I got off the phone and I just thought to myself, she is even more incredible than I originally thought. And then one day I got a Facebook message from Tamar and she said, I'm in Staten Island. I can meet you now if you want. So I live on the Upper West Side, and I'm sure everybody on this call knows that Staten Island is way closer to where you guys are in New Jersey than it is to where I am on the Upper West Side. And I said, to, I wrote back immediately. I said, give me two hours and I'll be there. And I dropped what I was doing and I drove out to Staten Island and I sat down with Tamar and I felt as if I knew her. Uh, once she told me that she went to Jewish day school, I said to myself, I do know her. We speak the same language. We, I know her. Uh, and at the end of the conversation, she looked at me and she kind of shrugged her shoulders and she said, I guess we can do this this summer if you really want to. And that was it. And Tamar, what did you think when Brad approached you? And what did you think about the whole concept of, of making this film? I thought Brad was insane, but he was persistent. And I did admire that. So I went along with it. But when I, when I finally met him, the thing is, I mean, you know, there's a lot. You really open yourself up to when you allow somebody to do a movie, especially a documentary. And, I, you know, I just didn't think that what I was doing was that interesting. And, you know, it was kind of like you know, I had my plans all worked out. My life was going exactly the way that I planned it to go. Just I was doing what I was doing from day to day. And I didn't know if I wanted to interrupt that with doing a documentary that nobody was going to watch or that he might not even really be all that interested in, you know, once he actually got to see what I did every day. So it was just like, yeah, I'm not going to waste my time with that because this is not this is just my life. This isn't like some amazing thing that I do every day. This is literally just my life. Like, you know, you wouldn't want to go to work with an accountant or with like, you know, a librarian. That's how I feel about what I do every day. It's just what I do. It's just my life. But um, he was very persistent and I did admire that. I, I did. I mean, there were sky writers, there were smoke signals, there were emails, texts, singing uh, telegram there were all sorts of stuff that he was determined and so i mean i kind of like that but when he said it took two hours to get from the upper west side to Staten island i'm gonna have to tell you i really didn't feel the enthusiasm anymore but now but now i know now after visiting numerous times i do understand staten island is not really actually part of new york i i don't think and two hours, honestly, Brad, I really appreciate you running all of those lights and using your hovercraft or whatever you did to get there as quickly as you did. It should have taken way longer than what it took you. So I appreciate that part. But when he got there, like he said, he was like, you know, like Brad Rothschild from my fifth grade Hornish class who I used to get kicked out of class with. Like, I'd known him my whole life. It was just like that. So I was like, okay. Well, let's see what happens here. I mean, we had, it was just, he, 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 he was picking up what I was putting down. He understood me. So I was like, okay, but let's see where this goes. And the rest was history. One thing that was so clear in the movie that I loved 
was that you, Tamar, are multidimensional. It's, it's about you as sort of a full person, as a woman, as a mother, as a Jew, as African-American, as a rabbi um, slash rabbi in training. And I hope you'll tell us um, what's going on um, in your rabbinical studies. Um, but you sort of, you're not sort of pigeonholed as an activist, change maker. I mean, really you wear a lot of hats in the movie. Um, so how, how was that, was that important to you to sort of be represented in what felt to, as the viewer to me as really your fullness? You know, Brad did a really good job with that because honestly, um, it's just me doing me, me doing what I actually do. Like all of those different hats that I wear, honestly, I just feel one, just, it's just the one, it's just me. And when I get up in the morning, it's just that one person. It's not, it's not just, just the woman, it's not a Jew, it's not me being black, it's not me being a rabbi, it's not any of those things. It's just me. And all of those things just so happen to be encompassed in me. I mean, like the song says, I'm every woman, it's all in me. And literally that's how, so it doesn't feel so heavy because I don't compartmentalize it like, like other people might think I do, but I don't. It's just, it's effortless. It's all a part of me. Like nobody else puts any thought into being Jewish. I don't either. I just, boom, I wake up and that's kind of how it goes. That's what I am. That's just, that's how it works. So I don't think about that. I don't think about being a woman. I don't think about being, I don't think about any of those things. I just get up and I do, and I go, and I'm driven by all of those things. And I was actually offered to me, so I know it's supposed to be ordained December 12th, but COVID had other plans. So um, it, I've no longer been denied, it's just delayed. So that's really great. So I'm kind of excited about that. So. Once I have a date for that, I'll be sure to let everybody know because I want all of my new friends that I've met on Zoom to Zoom in for the ceremony. Mazel tov. So that means that the organization had that vote that I remember in the in the film, they, they had postponed the vote about women. You know, I'm not clear how they arrived at the decision. I just know it was offered. And so that's it. I don't know who, I don't know how they voted. I don't even know when they voted. I don't know how it went. I just know that I got the offer. And actually, when it was offered, they wanted to do it at the end of October. And I was like, yeah, I can't do that. I'm too busy. Like, that's my busiest time. Then we were right in the middle of the push for Thanksgiving. We gave out a thousand Thanksgiving dinner boxes. And I mean, a Thanksgiving dinner box is like a, a full course Thanksgiving dinner for a family of four. We gave out over a thousand of those boxes in four different states. So we did a Thanksgiving road trip that was a lot to coordinate. And then while I'm working on that, you're saying, hey, you know what? We're ready to ordain you. Yeah, not now. I can't do it at the moment. But hold that thought and we'll come back to it. So when we came back to it, when we came back with December 12th, then COVID happened. So it pushed it back further. But I mean, it, 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 for me, it's okay. It's all good because it doesn't change the work. It's not like when I become a rabbi tomorrow, Manasseh, I'm going to work any harder than I did when I was Tamara Manasseh. The work doesn't change. I still do the exact same work that I'm going to do the day after I become a rabbi. So it, it's kind of like, I mean, it's really, my mother really wants to see it. And I mean, it's going to be a really great certificate on the wall, but it doesn't necessarily change who I am. It doesn't change the work. It doesn't change my commitment to doing the work. Seeing you sort of stand up, um, you know, in the in the film and lead, you know, the Sukkot, um, you know, service and with the lulav and etrog and seeing you lead a Passover Seder. And I read that you also led a Yom Kippur service with Yisker. Um, you know, you you really stand up there as a rabbi already as a as a religious figure. And um, I think I'm wondering, you know, your sort of presentation to the community of uh, of Judaism and also your interaction with local Jewish community groups as you expand throughout the movie. Um, can you tell us a little about those connections and how you've developed and nurtured them? And also what's, what's the reaction in the neighborhood to Judaism and to, you know, the holidays and everything that you share? The neighborhood needs Judaism. It actually needs it. I mean, I didn't know that before I went there, but it does. It actually needs it. It needs the thing that Jews have to offer. And that's not money and it's not necessarily just donations. It's what we actually, it's our principles, it's our values, it's our beliefs. It's, it's our outlook on the world. It's the way that we see the world, the way that we're taught to see the world. They need that. We need that. The neighborhood needs that. Um, 
I want people to understand. And those people on that block, that's my family. Those people are my family. Those are my people. And I want them to understand why I do what I do. Because a lot of people wonder, hey, what, what is, what is, what, what do you do this for? Why do you do this? Because in neighborhoods like that, nobody goes in for poor neighborhoods where Black people are and gives them free stuff. Nobody cares whether they live or die. Nobody cares about what kind of school their kids go to. Nobody cares about that unless they're asking for a vote. Otherwise, no one cares. It's like they, they're there, but they're not there. They don't actually exist until election time. And for me to go there and say, hey, you know, I'm doing this just because I want you to stay alive. Because I want to figure out what's killing you. And I want to stop it from happening. So it's like, well, why are you like this? Because I'm a, I'm a Jew? Because I'm Jewish. I mean, you grow up, you do Yom HaShoah every year, you observe that every year. I mean, I'm Black. If I wasn't, if I was Black and Jewish still, and I didn't go to Jewish day school, I may have known what Yom HaShoah was, but I would have never been up close and personal with the grief that so many of my friends and so many of the people that were around me at that school experienced on Yom HaShoah, and I could relate to that. I understood it. I understood that pain. I, pain is Pain is, it transcends race, it transcends religion, it transcends age, it transcends everything. Pain is pain, grief is grief. And I understand it, I stood it, and I felt it. And those were my people too. And so the thing is, you grow up hearing about how, you know, when they came for all of these different people, I didn't say anything, but when they came for me, nobody was left. And the thing was, I, I mean, I grew up hearing that every year, Reverend Niemaller, every year, every year. And then I realized it didn't matter that I was Jewish. My son was getting his, his suit cut for his bar mitzvah. We were at the tailor. And um, a story came on the news. And two kids, two young boys had been murdered on the west side of Chicago that day. And they were maybe a year older than him. And I couldn't help but think, hey, these mothers are somewhere picking out the last suits, maybe the only suit their sons will ever wear. While I'm picking out my sons, my son is getting his bar mitzvah suit cut. And, and how can that not be me? I mean, we're both Black. We're about the same age. I mean, we both live in the hood. How can that not be me? Just because I'm Jewish? So for a while, I think I thought like that. And then my daughter... Um, one of her friends was murdered at a bus stop that he used to wait with her every day when she went to work. And this one day, she didn't go to work because she wasn't feeling well. And this kid was murdered at the bus stop. And she called me and she said, Mommy, they killed my friend. And you have to stop this. You have to do something about it. Now, A, how does a mother stop gun violence in Chicago? But B, this is your friend who waits at the bus stop with you every day when you go to work and you didn't go to work today just let that sink in for a minute my jewish daughter has friends who have been murdered and it could have very well been her had she went to work that day so that meant that this star rock was on my side of the wall now it was getting closer to me it was in my house now so now if my kid has friends who get who are getting murdered then how long will it be before one of my kids is murdered? And it, it doesn't matter that they're Jewish. Nobody cares about that. Black, they're still Black. Black kids are getting murdered. It's not a rash of Jewish kids in Chicago getting murdered, but it is a lot of Black kids getting murdered. So the thing was, um, being Jewish tells you um, something can absolutely be done about this. Being Black says, you know, something should be done. Somebody should do something. But being human says, you must absolutely do something. You must do it. You must. You must. So if you know that something can be done, then you must be the one to do it. So it was a matter of figuring out exactly what is this thing? How do you stop gun violence? The thing is, you can't stop it if you don't understand it. And you can't understand it sitting in your living room. You can't understand it sitting behind a desk. You have to be actually out there where it's happening to understand it. And so the thing for me was I had to go there. I had to be in it to understand it. And now people are thinking like, I mean, there was there were people taking the air pool going, like they, they were placing back, like how long will it be before one of these mothers gets shot on this corner? 
And people thought I was absolutely insane for going out there. But I was supposed to be there. That's what I was supposed to be. And the thing was, people in the neighborhood, it was the, why are you doing this? And, you know, it's hard to explain to them what Judaism says about activism, about being a man where there are no men, about duty, about responsibility. It's hard to explain that. So I didn't explain it. I just showed it to him. Showed it to him. Because this is who I am. This is what I was taught to do. This is what Jews do. Well, I didn't know. I don't even know any Jews. I didn't know black people could be Jews. And, you know, but this is what Jews actually do. Other than what is it now? Control the weather and have space lasers. We do good stuff in the world. That's what we do. This is actually what we do. And the more I did that, the first Yom Kippur I went out there, it was, um, I wasn't supposed to even be there that day. And it was very warm. And I was there and I popped up and I was cooking dinner and people were like, what are you doing here? And I wasn't eating because I was fasting. And they were all, they were saying like, hey, you know, why aren't you eating? You're already skinny enough. No, I'm not dieting. It's not a diet. I'm fasting. Well, why are you fasting? So then I, I had to explain what Yom Kippur was about. And just in the explanation, so many people were saying, you know what? I'm not going to eat right now either. I'm going to wait and I'm going to break the fast with you. And it just start happening year after year. So a conversation about, about forgiveness and about um, repentance and about returning to God after you've been, I mean, after you've killed and I mean, have so many people around you that have been killed and all of the things that you do to survive, to know that you still are somewhere within the consciousness of God, that you can still return to God, that you don't have to wait to die to, to be judged, that you can do this every year. It actually made them better the next year. So when people say, hey, what do you think stops the violence? You know, I could, I mean, I could just say, you know, it's, it's, it's the food, it's the care, it's the attention that we pay to things, it's, it's, it's addressing food insecurity and educational um, issues and joblessness and homelessness, all of these. I can say that, but I can also say it's Yom Kippur that did. It's the idea of I can start over today and I don't have to be who I was yesterday. And God has forgiven me and I have a clean slate and I can get it. I can do better this time. I can get it right this year. They've never been introduced to that before. Nobody ever tells them that. It's always this, you know, a heaven and hell thing. It's the God and the devil. And it's, 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 it's fire and brimstone. It's never anything that has to do with forgiveness and return. And act, actually for free, free of charge on a corner, you don't actually have to go into a church to do this. You can actually do this right here, right now. It is, it is, I mean, it was transformative to a lot of these kids. So everybody in the neighborhood knows when, when Sukkot is coming. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows. Everybody knows when Pesach is coming. And everybody understands it because it relates to them. The idea of the Jews of what happens if, Jew, if the Jews never left Egypt. What happened? They become American. And that's how, that's what happened. And it's like, they can relate to that. They can relate to all of these different stories. And but the thing is, the nearest synagogue to that corner is five, six miles away. And it's in a neighborhood where there aren't any black people, especially not poor ones. And outside of the synagogue, there are police posted. So they, I mean, you're, it's kind of you're, it's kind of a deterrent. You don't want to really go in because the cops are outside. And then if you go in, everybody's looking at you because there are no other black people there. So where do they find Judaism? Where do they find it? They don't. So the idea of me bringing it to them changed everything. So it was like I finally got to see when Judaism was is taken out of the four walls. And, and, and we're not afraid to let it roam free in the world. It has these healing properties. It's the bomb. It's the healing bomb. It fixes a lot of things. It's just because of anti-Semitism and everything the Jews have been through. We're afraid to do that in public. We're afraid to share that with, with other people. We kind of keep it amongst ourselves, but it's not us who needs it. We have it already. We need to share it with the world. That's, that's who needs it. The cracks are in the world. It's not necessarily in us. It's in the world. Wow. Thank you. Um, 
I'm just, I'm so struck by the idea of the public square Judaism that, uh, that we talk about, but that you are, you're really doing it. You're really living it and really sharing it in the public and letting it be, letting it be what it is, how people take it in and letting it, letting it, you know, have an impact. Um, Brad, I'm curious for you, you know, as the filmmaker, when you were making this documentary, how, you know, did you ever insert yourself into the narrative at all? How do you sort of keep a distance? Um, how was that for you? Yeah, my, my style of filmmaking is to be as unobtrusive as possible and not to insert myself into what's going on. Um, Atara was joking with me earlier tonight that she saw me in the film in the background a couple of times. And it's true because what I found is that when you're on the block, you can't just stand around and do nothing. And not that I was doing nothing when I was you know, directing the, the crew and, and making the film, but when you find yourself standing there, there's always some something to do, whether it's help with the grill or pick up a box or take it. There's always some work to do, and you can see me doing all of those things in the film. But in terms of uh, what I see my role as as a filmmaker, I'm trying to document Tamar's reality, uh, and I'm not trying to direct um, the action in a way that's not natural and not real so as i see my role it is to have a camera on tamar and to sort of fade into the background as much as possible in order to allow her to do what she does and for me to try to capture what it was that i found so compelling about her and part of the way i do that is i keep a very small crew so i had one camera person who did sound so we put a microphone on Tamar's uh, collar and it was run through the, the camera and the cameraman followed my directions and followed Tamar. But as I said, our role was not to get involved in the story. And there are filmmakers who make themselves part of the story. And some of them are very successful filmmakers and make very interesting uh, and entertaining films, but this was a film about Tamar Manasseh. It's not a film about Brad Rothschild discovered Tamar Manasseh, who didn't need discovering because she was already doing the incredible work that she was doing. I, I, I really wanted this film to bring Tamar to a wider audience, to give her a louder megaphone, and to, to give her a larger platform. And I think so far that we've been successful in that. I was going to ask you, Brad, are you at all surprised by the great impact that this film is having? It sounds like you're not surprised. I mean, I don't know if I would use the word surprise. I'm grateful. I'm grateful because I, it took me a long time to make this film. This film is really important to me. Um, but I'm grateful because it's accomplishing what we set out to accomplish, which is to help spread the word about this incredible person. So if I can be successful at that, I'm incredibly happy. Tamar, there's a question about how mask has been operating um, this, especially this past summer during COVID. Um, so if you could tell us a little about that. Okay. Well, we kept kind of kicked it into overdrive. When the rest of the world went, and this is the really like condensed story, is the shorter form. Um, we actually on that corner built a school, and we built the school last year. Well, the year before last, actually, before COVID was even a thing, we built the school. But we were building a trade school and a vocational kind of thing. It helped kids get GEDs and stuff like that because they closed down all of the high schools in Inglewood. So there are no public high schools. So it's not just about kids who drop out. It's about what happens to the kids who are graduating from eighth grade who don't have a neighborhood school to go to. So they just opt to not go to school because if they have to go two miles in any direction, which is, and, and all of the schools that are the alternative schools for them are all outside of a two mile radius, you're going through at least three or four gang territory. And these aren't necessarily the best schools in the city. So these kids are saying, I'm not going to go into another neighborhood and risk getting murdered 
for a bad education. I'm just not going to go to school at all. So that's what we had a lot of. And the city didn't really address that. So we were going to build, a vo- we built a vocational school. We were going to help kids with life skills and GEDs and all of these other different things. We had a lot of programming lined up. And then uh, we built them out of shipping containers. I'm so proud of that part. Like that, that is the best part about all of this. We took shipping containers and retrofitted them as classrooms. And it kind of came from the idea of the one room schoolhouse, like in the South, when black people, I mean, some of the greatest black thinkers of our time came out of one room schoolhouses in the South. So I figured, why can't we do that again? So it was like a black educational renaissance for me. We can have pop-up stores and pop-up shops and pop-up restaurants. Why can't we have pop-up schools? So the idea was to make education as accessible to these kids as I possibly could. It's not, it's not learning that they didn't want to do. It's school that they didn't want to do. So if the idea was to make school as accessible as possible. So, hey, I'm going to put it on the corner of your block. So we were almost set to open up this vocational school. We were super excited about the block academy. Then COVID happened. So now we have all of these little kids who aren't going to school. But not just, we don't, we have all the little kids not going to school. We have a, a neighborhood full of parents who are essential workers. And the essential workers that are not very well paid. It's the Instacart shoppers. It's the Uber Eats drivers. It's those people, the people who stock the shelves at the supermarkets and the drugstores. It's those people. And so these parents are faced with losing their jobs or leaving their five-year-old and their three-year-old at home in the care of their nine-year-old. So these are decisions that no parents should have to make. So instead of actually having a, actually doing our vocational school and working with, with, with teenagers and young adults like we were going to do, we had to shift gears and we had to turn it into an e-learning center. So since March 17th of 2020, we've had kids in our classroom every day, every day. So we've gotten to see up close and personal the cracks that exist within the public school system, not just in Chicago, but, you know, like, I'm pretty sure this is what it's like across the board all over the country. And so we see how far behind these kids were when they came in. And that was when COVID just had just started. They were already behind. And so I tell people all the time, what we try to do is we make sure we bring them up, at least get them to grade level. And some of them actually surpass it. They, They are performing really great having a smaller class size with so many teachers and so much attention and really a tailored educational experience just to their learning style. And so I'm a little worried about what happens to them when they go back into public school because they won't get that anymore. But what COVID did, the healthcare crisis that it caused in America, that crisis is going to be, I mean, nothing compared to the educational crisis that it's going to cause on the other side of this. After everybody is all immunized and we've all had shots and COVID is not an issue anymore, education is going to be. So it's not going to be something that just regular schools can handle. You're going to need the same way you needed all hands on deck with healthcare professionals. You're going to need all hands on deck with educators. You're going to need tutors. You're going to need parents to step up and say, hey, well, you know, I can tutor. I can tutor kindergartners in, in reading or phonics or something. But we're going to need all hands on deck with this because a generation of kids have really fallen behind because of COVID. And the thing is, you might not necessarily see the results now, but you will absolutely see what this called. Give it, give it about 10 years when these kids can't perform, when they aren't able to compete, when they can't get the jobs because they can't read or they can't fill out job applications, they can't get into college. Just give it a few years, but it's going to become the, the effects of all of this is going to become apparent in about 10 years. And the thing is, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to keep that from happening. We're trying to keep as many kids from falling between the cracks as we can. So since COVID started, that's just one of the things. That's one of the largest things that we've been working on. There are a lot of questions about about mask, and it sounds like you know you are definitely expanding the mission in terms of education. Um, you know, there's some questions about if you're you know expanding to other cities. Um, oh yeah. You know what kind of uh, yeah any sort of change in focus? So if you could tell us yeah what's going on with that. Yeah, we're expanding to other cities. We uh, actually we've been pushing into the deep south, and um, 
we are actually, it's, it's something, one of our biggest chapters is actually in Staten Island. That's why I was in Staten Island when I talked to Brad. But we're actually even talking about now expanding into New Jersey. So, and building one of our pop-up schools there somewhere. So I'm pretty excited about that too. But um, yeah, the thing is, we don't go into other cities unless we're invited. Because we can't go to someone else's city, someone else's community and tell them what they need. So if we're invited, then we'll come and we'll help help communities and we'll help groups or whatever. But we have to be invited. But for me, um, it's not just so much about math anymore. When I go into these places now, I've realized that I'm a bridge between the Black community and the Jewish community. And I have so in so many of these conversations, I hear over and over again um, how much people want to rebuild the bridges or build bridges between the Black community and the Jewish community. And for better or worse, whether we like it or not, that goes through the Black Jewish community. You want a bridge, it has to go through the Black Jewish community to get there. So the thing is, when I go to these places and I start, no matter where I go, and to start a new chapter of math, I always, I always connect with the Jewish community there as well. So I can actually make real connections on the ground between people in these cities. So you don't have to ask me what it is that I think, what, what do we need or anything like that? What, does the, what do Black people in your city need? What do you need? What is it you need for Black people in your city? What do you, because right now, uh, the Jewish community needs allies. Like, I mean, we've never needed it before. We definitely need allies. The Black community and the Jewish community have the same monsters under the bed now. And we've never needed each other as much as we need each other now. And so if I can be a part of building the bridges that protect us from white supremacy and those attacks and things like that, then I want to do that. So when I go places, I make sure I, I host events, I facilitate meetings between people in the Black community and the Jewish community so they can actually have a conversation about how do we build this bridge? What do I need? What do you need? How do we build this together? What do we do? So I'm really happy to see how that's working in Memphis. I really love it. And it's it's a, it's starting to look a lot like it looks in the movie in Chicago. So my my I mean my dream is to be able to go whatever city we go into to be able to create that kind of relationship that you see the black and the Jewish community have in the movie to be able to create that everywhere. There's a question um, from someone about the gentleman who was encouraging you throughout the film to run for office. Um, he was pretty relentless um, and just wondering, are you thinking of running for office? And the questioner says, please say yes. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no. I mean, come on, American politics is hard for right now. I don't even think my insurance would even pay out if I ran for, I mean, no, I can't. I want to do real actual things. I want to make do real big things. I want to do important things. I want to really change people's lives. I really want to make the world a better place. And I've learned that if you're from a red state or a blue state or you have a D or an R behind your name, you, you just can't be as effective. It's, this country is way too tribal right now. And I just don't want to be hamstrung by that. I want to be able to be as effective as I can possibly be. I want to be having great of an impact as I can have. And I don't want anybody's political views. I don't want my own political views hindering that. So not, not now. Maybe one day, but not now. What do you find is sort of the, the legacy of your efforts in the neighborhood where you were sitting and looking back? Um, and in particular, you know, you express frustration in the film about the city not being supportive and often being sort of a roadblock um, to what you were doing. Have things changed there? And, and what is the legacy, do you think? No, nothing's changed with me in the city. It's, it just is what it is. And, I, you know, I don't expect for it to change because it just kind of is what it is. So I don't, I don't rely on the city to do anything. Anything that I need to get done, we find a way to get it done. But, um, I mean, I think the legacy is change. It's doing things in this brand new way. It's being able to, to see change as it's not brought about by marches or it's not necessarily it's something you do every day, that, that being a change becomes a way of life. It's not a club that you join. It's not you know, something you do just in the summer. It's not something you just do on weekends. It's not, it's something you do every day. 
it's becoming, it's a way of life. People expect to see that school open every day. They expect to see us hanging around on weekends and stuff like that. People are asking, hey, well, what can I do? Or they'll come to you and say, hey, I had an idea to do this. It is, it is the idea of the legacy is changed. The legacy is the inspiration is inspiring regular people in the neighborhood to be, I mean, to do extraordinary things for their community. To empower them is the legacy of empowerment, empowering them to take control of what goes on in their community and have pos a positive effect on it. So, I mean, like, I think that's pretty much what I would want it to be. That that normal people, that normal everyday people, feel like they they too can do extraordinary things. Brad, uh, this film is being shown in a lot of synagogues and JCCs and Jewish organizations. Wondering who is the target audience? Would you say for the movie, and what is the message that the film really conveys for you? I would I would like to think that the target audience is everybody, but I mean, you know, when you have you're trying to market the film you have to you know target your audience a little bit more than just the entire country or the entire world because you know that kind of marketing doesn't work um i would hope as you said it's being screened throughout uh jewish film festivals jewish community centers and synagogues and that's that's part of the distribution strategy that our distributor has menemsha films and they have a great connections within the Jewish world. So part of the decision that I made by, in going with them was for that reason. Uh, I had always hoped that Jewish, a Jewish audience would watch this film uh, and learn something new about Judaism uh, and about, I mean, you know, they, they use the word Ashkenormative Judaism a lot these days. Uh, when we were growing up, we didn't realize that there was something called Ashkenormative Judaism. We just thought it was Judaism. And I can probably speak for my classmates who uh, were in school with me. Uh, there weren't a lot of non-Ashkenazic Jews in, in the school. There just weren't. Um, so I think the audience that I would like to see this would be people who had no have no idea that there are Black Jews and that there are uh, non-white Jews and Jews of, of different backgrounds. Um, so that, that's, I, I guess, the answer to your first question. The second question is, what do I hope uh, people take away from the film? I really hope that people see that anybody can make a difference by just doing something. And, and that's the, the lesson of Tamar. Um, Tamar said, I'm going to go sit on this corner and nobody's going to shoot at anybody else because I'm here. And it's such a simple idea, but it's also revolutionary at the same time. Uh, and it's revolutionary because it worked. And because how many people come up with the idea and then follow through on it, not one day, not two days, but every day. Every day, no matter what the weather, no matter what they, how they feel, no matter what's going on in their personal life or in their professional life, they're out, she's out there. And the commitment that she has made is what has produced the result. So what I hope is that everybody who watches this film says, I can do something too. It may not be what she does, but I can certainly do something. Thank you. And Brad, I think there might be a little bit of static on your end, um, just to we can try or if we mute and you can sort of see if we can figure it out, but it's, it's not terrible, but just a few people were noticing it. So I wanted to make sure, you know, it's okay though. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, there it is. Um, so Tamar, there's a, there's a question for you about, um, about being black and Jewish. And, you know, um, the questioner um, raises the fact that a lot of synagogues are wrestling with this intentionally or not, Jews of color often feel othered in, as you said, Brad, in Ashkenormative normative spaces or in predominantly white Jewish synagogues and communities. Has that been your experience? Um, I did, I read, you know, that you um, often feel, you know, when, when getting a question about your Jewish background, that there's this sort of needing to pull apart and this like, you know, really kind of inappropriate um, investigation 
um, that the questioner might have. Yeah. So that's not where we're coming from, but have oh, you no, felt understand. that othering or, or have you felt welcomed by the communities that you visited? And I hope that, I hope the experience has been more positive than not, but what has your experience been? I didn't, I didn't become a Jew when I went to college or later in life. I've done this literally my entire life. My entire life, this is who I've been. So me feeling unwelcome, and I mean, I went to Jewish day school and I lived in like one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country. But I went to, the school that I went to was probably in one of the most affluent. So it's, it's on the campus of the University of Chicago. It's less than a mile from Barack Obama's Chicago home. It's, I mean, it's nothing like the neighborhood I came from. It's in the other Chicago. It's not in, it's, it's, it's like a tale of two cities here. I lived in one Chicago, but I was educated in another. So I got over feeling unwelcome a long time ago. Like I haven't, I haven't struggled with that since, I mean, like I was struggling with, I mean, just puberty. Like it was all, all of it was happening at the same time. Nothing that I, I have never really struggled with that. I don't care what other Jews think about me. I, I really don't. I don't. Just like I don't care what other Black people think about me. I'm a Jew because of the, of the way that I, the, through the lens I view God. That's what makes me a Jew. It's not the Jewish people that makes me a Jew. It's God that made me a Jew. The Jewish people weren't there when I was born. God was. So I don't necessarily worry so much about acceptance from anybody. I don't, it, I don't feel anything about that. And I don't struggle with that. But I know a lot of other Black Jews do. I just don't. The thing is, I am a realist above, before I'm anything else, I am a realist. This is America. I am Black. You are white. We, those are white spaces. And I tell people all the time, the Jews, we have, to, we have to work on this. Because you shouldn't be able to look at, you should be able to look at a synagogue on, on Shabbat morning and a Southern Baptist church on Sunday in Alabama and you should be able to clearly tell the difference between the two. But if, if there are nothing but white people at the synagogue and there are nothing but white people at the church, how do you know that they're different? So you can say, hey, you know what? I'm not racist and I'm not like these people, but it doesn't look like that. No temple, no temple should, no, no house of worship, no anywhere where we're coming together to worship God should be all anything. It shouldn't be all white. It shouldn't be all black. It just should not be all anything. And, and my thing is, when I go to, to spaces like that, those Ashkenazi spaces, and I go to synagogues where I'm the only Black person, I don't cringe. I'm actually a little bit embarrassed for them. And it's like, oh, no, you have to have more Black people here. You got to get some color in here. Because you can't really be who you say you are if you don't. You can say you're welcoming, and you can say that, you know, you don't see color and you don't eat. You can say all of these things, but you're not actually challenged by it because there are no, there's no other color here. So we really have to get past that. We really have to do better with that. But because we're American, we do struggle with that. We really, really do. Brad and I were talking um, the other day about the idea of justice, justice, you shall pursue. And then there's this conversation about defunding the police. So you have Jews who feel like it's ridiculous to even have a discussion about defunding the police or redistributing those funds or stuff like that. They won't even entertain that conversation. But then you have a lot of other Jews who are, are leading the fight for it because justice, pursuing justice for who? Who gets the justice? How does that work? So there are a lot of very, it's, it's a lot of very black and white issues that exist in the Jewish community. And the thing is, we have to quit denying that Americanism, that all of the issues that affect every other Black person or white person in America don't affect Jews too, because it does. And we can't have an honest conversation until we start to talk about that. That yes, I am Black, and yes, you are white, but yes, we are both Jewish. So we are both affected by the same thing. I wouldn't be sitting on a corner if I weren't Black and black, black kids weren't getting killed and I wasn't the mother of Black kids. If I was just Jewish, if I was only Jewish and white, I wouldn't be sitting out there because white Jewish kids are not getting killed. Well, my Black Jewish kids will definitely get murdered. 
they will definitely, nobody will think twice before they pull a trigger because, oh, they're Jewish. No, because they don't look Jewish. So no. So we are all affected by the same stuff the people in our communities are affected by. The thing is, the challenge for us is how do we rise above it? How do we somehow become better and bigger than those things? How do we become the example? How do we become um, the, the model of how we are supposed to deal with these things? How do we say, okay, I understand. This is who you are. This is who I am. Now we're going to move on past that. How do we do that? And we have a chance to be the model to show the rest of the world how that's done. We just kind of have to do it. And it's, I think that, that so many people are struggling with, hey, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just be more inclusive and I'm going to, but first, before you do that, we at least have to talk about what the problem is. And I'm okay with talking about what the problem is. I understand when you come down to my block, you're scared. I get that. There are black people that are scared. We can talk about these things. You understand, you should understand. I don't always feel safe when I come to your neighborhood. I'm black, there are no other black people around here. And the police in Chicago and Illinois don't necessarily like to see black people in all white neighborhoods that they shouldn't be in. I went to a Seder a few years back and I had to leave and I was like, I can't, I can't drink any, I can't do any kiddish, I can't drink anything because I can't, if I get in my car and it's kind of like, oh, you know, it smells like, well, I only had like a sip of wine. Well, why would you, you're drinking and driving? No, it's, a, it's, it's Pesach and I was at a Seder and I'm, is a cop really going to believe that I'm, I'm drunk off kosher wine or I've been drinking kosher wine because it's Pesach? No, they're not going to believe that in Chicago. And I might go to jail or, or worse. These are things that I have to worry about in these really awesome neighborhoods where they're super safe. They're all white and they're all Jewish. And I have to worry about that. So I don't necessarily feel the safest when I come to your neighborhood either. These are discussions that we have to have. It's not just about, uh, it, it, it's about me opening the door for you in my neighborhood like I do on my block. But it's also about you opening the door for me on yours. And that's the conversation that we don't have. It's not magical. It's going to be painful. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. But it's important. It's important. It changes the world. It changes the way we do everything. And it, it's, this is what Jews are supposed to do. This is who we're supposed to be in the world. So it's kind of like, I don't really, I mean, I understand where other Black Jews are coming from or, you know, Jews of color. I understand where they're coming from. I just don't feel it. I mean, I, I, I'm i not, I mean, I can't separate the two. I don't, I never, like I said, I don't compartmentalize. I am Black and I am Jewish and I'm both of those things all the time. So if I go in a room and people are acting weird with me, I'm probably going to say, oh my goodness, is there something on my face? Is it this outfit? Is it my hair? Is it this? I'm not going to necessarily say it's because I'm Black. If I'm in a room full of Jews, because I'm just a Jew. And I'm a Jew and you're a Jew and this is just how it should go. And we all need to get to a place where it's like that. I wish we had so much more time. Um, but I want to ask both of you, first of all, Brad, what does, if you were imagining a sequel, to this movie, um, what would it be about? And a similar question to you, Tamar, you know, what's what's the future holding for you? What's, I know you're working on school and you're expanding in other cities. Um, what, what can you tell us about what's happening for you in the future? Bradford, you first. So, okay, so I am envisioning a sequel and what Tamar just spent the last five minutes talking about, that's going to be the sequel. It's going to be about uh, how black Jews are the bridge between the white Jewish community and the black community in America. Uh, and the work that needs to be done uh, between the two communities to bring us closer together. Because as Samar said, we have the same enemies. And we've always had the same enemies. Uh, and sometimes we lose sight of that. But uh, to me, it's an important thing to repair this relationship, and I think people like Tamar are, like she said, she is the bird, and that's what the film will be about. 
and Tamar? Um, yeah, like Brad said, that's the future where this this sequel, we're already shaping and forming it and we're excited about it. I mean, I think that that is, um, that it's really important to tell this next story because honestly, there are a lot of questions that, that Black Jews have about the white Jewish community and a lot of questions white Jews have about the Black Jewish community. We are all the same just like all Ashkenazi Jews are not the same, where we are, people want to understand the, the differences and the nuances and all of that. And I think it's very important that we understand each other. So there are a lot of these questions are answered because it, 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 there are Jews who, it, it's, it's funny, it, it, there, there are white Jews who don't believe black people Guys, All right, guys. But there are Black Jews who believe that there that there's no such thing that white people can't be Jews. So we're going to talk to everybody in this movie. We're going to have a conversation with all of these different people, with all of these different ideas, so people can kind of see where they fit into all of this. Because I think that that's an. I'm sorry, my daughter keeps calling me on on Zoom. Sorry, guys, but I think that that's an important that's an important conversation to have you there are so many people that have questions and it's a whole lot more comfortable to watch a movie and have these questions answered rather than have to actually go and ask somebody the question because we don't always know how to ask questions like you said that's not what we're doing here I don't you don't mean that it's not coming from a place where you're being offensive or somebody's doing this investigative work into who I am no this is a movie that answers all of those questions it just makes things so much easier and it makes it easier to build from that. It makes it easier to build on that. It makes it easier to grow from that because we kind of know, we kind of all know where we stand. We kind of all get to see, hey, you know what? I'm not so different from them. We kind of believe the same things. We kind of think, we kind of see this the same way. So it's a movie about finding similarities. It's about finding, make, creating the bridges. That's what it's about. Thank you. And we'll just end end in just a few minutes. But but on that note, you know, Tamar, you as a bridge builder, your honesty, your openness, your your passion um, is so inspiring. And we can it came across in the film and it came across tonight um, why you are a bridge builder and also a change maker in in so many in so many communities. Um, and uh, several people wrote this to me, and this also is is from me as a rabbi at Bethel. But you are always welcome at Bethel, and we hope to one day welcome you in person. Um, and just know that that's that's a home for you too. Hopefully um, soon. Hopefully, hopefully soon. soon. Yeah. Yes. Thank you know. Thankfully, we were able to to have this program you know in this way, but but hopefully soon in person. Um, and and speaking of that in person, um, I just want to say that the gift that you provide by sitting on that corner, I was so struck by the the godliness of it. And I say that because the the name Adonai Yud Hey Vav Hey is uh, really from the root to be Lihio Tayahove Yihye, just being presence um, and the gift of that presence and what it provides, um, knowing the, that you are there every day and what that does for kids and families. It's a film about community building. It's a film about presence and what it means to be there for people. Um, and thank you for providing that presence also for us tonight and for sharing your, your wisdom and your thoughts. And we're so grateful to both of you. Um, I wanna invite Atara back also to, to express some gratitude. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say this is a great way to end Black History Month, which, you know, is we've offered many programs over the last 28 days, and this couldn't be a better capstone for some of the conversations we've been having. So thank you for the timing and, and helping us close it out. But I also wanted to really thank both of you for being here for every great story and every moment of illumination, there's someone who made the story visible to us. And Brad, you've done a great job and couldn't be more proud of you as a, a classmate and friend. But you know, the fact that you brought Tamar into our lives and allowed us to see what, what it looks like when inspired Judaism has legs and moves around, it's really amazing. And we thank you both for being part of our community tonight. It, it's been amazing. And you know, we, we could have you back and fill hours of your time 
um, if you let us, and we hope you will at some point. Good luck with both of your next endeavors. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here for this wonderful discussion. We look forward to, to the next film, of course. Good night, everyone. Lila So. Lila So. Thank you.